this paper, uh, the paper which I'm going to present today, is based on a it's based on a current research project uh, which I've been working on for for around a year now. So, so the project is essentially looking at the press, the Turkish language press, from 1870 to about 1930, and looking at what kind of information we can find about music. I seem to have lost the PowerPoint. There. Sorry, can you could you put the PowerPoint up again? Um, well, let me carry on anyway while you uh, while you're doing that. So, so today I'll just speak about a very small part of this project. So, so the press, the Turkish language press, even without thinking about the Greek language or Armenian language press, is a really huge archive of material about music and about social life and cultural life in Istanbul. And there's, I mean, there's literally hundreds or thousands of um, thousands of articles on these kinds of subjects. So, so the press, the Ottoman press, sort of the first time that you really get sort of critical critical discussion of music and cultural life is in the 1870s. So before the 1870s, at least in Turkish, there's there's some occasional mentions of music in the news, but you don't really have a sort of critical debate. Um, so, so it'd be good to, to see that next slide now, if possible. But uh, <laughs> let me carry on talking anyway, and then I'll, hopefully the slides will, will catch up. Um, so there's so there's several journals which are published in the 1870s, uh, which are satirical, humorous, humorous journals, and they're kind of explicitly their explicit purpose is to provide a kind of commentary, a critique on. Con contemporary urban life. Um, so if you go to, to slide two. Uh, previous one, two. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so 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 these are these are, these are some of the journals that I'm gonna speak about today. Two of them, Diogen and Hayal, and several others, they they were founded and edited by a Greek, an Ottoman Greek uh, journalist. Uh, Theodor Kassab. Um, so the contributions to these papers could could come from Muslim, journalists, Greek, Armenian. I mean, it's a relatively mixed um, <clears throat> social environment. They're, they're generally, well, they're obviously educated, sort of bourgeois, uh, kind of bourgeois middle class. So, so although they're quite critical about Contemporary society at the same time, they, they emphasize certain bourgeois values like respectability, uh, moderation, and so on. Um, so, so the next slide, please. Yeah, so so this is an example from Hayal, one of Theodore Kassab's papers. So the these newspapers are often quite short-lived, so sometimes they only lasted for a couple of years or three or four years, and uh, then for economic reasons or political reasons, censorship, they could be shut down. Um, several of them were connected with the young Ottomans, so people like uh, Mama Kemal, so um, they could sort of sometimes deal with politically sensitive topics, and that, that would be a reason for them to be shut down. So, so as you can see here, uh, they include some sort of cartoons, uh, humorous cartoons. In this case, you have two figures, two Armenian figures on the right-hand side, Dikran Juhajian, 
who is, who is an Armenian composer. And then on the left is Gulu Agop, who, who established the Ottoman theatre, Osman the Teatro And the kind of performances that, that, uh, that occurred in Osman the Teatro these included theatre and also what is referred to as opera, but it's actually operetta, so a sort of light comic, comic opera. Gulu Agop's theatre uh, usually had translated um, operas, operas tra translated from French or Italian, whereas Chuatian Chuatian was the first person to compose opera or comic opera operetta in Turkish. So, so this was a central sort of theme um, during the 1870s. This was very often discussed in the press, the relationship between Gulu Agop and Chuatian, which was kind of a competition or a rivalry. The press tend, tended to be very critical of Gulu Agop. Um, and a lot of the discussion revolves around the question of translation, so linguistic translation and then cultural music, cultural and musical and aesthetic translation. And so how, how do you translate Western European musical forms, cultural forms? How do you translate them into a local uh, context? How do you adapt them to, to the morality and to the taste of local Ottoman listeners? Um, so, so I'll just give a few examples now in the rest of the paper uh, from, from these journals. And, but I'm going to focus a bit more on, well, yeah, so this process of translation, this occurred on several different social levels. So, so it's important to, to sort of bear in mind the different social economic layers here. So you have the elite context, uh, diplomatic context, sort of state-led reform with the music and so on. And then you have a bit more sort of bourgeois middle class context with the Ottoman theater. And then you have the lower class uh, venues, casinos, cafes, and things like that. So, so I want to look in this paper about descriptions of these lower class venues, casinos, and cafes, um, and especially about the the role or the representation of musicians from different different confessional or ethnic backgrounds in these kind of lower class musical venues. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so so the programs at these uh, venues, especially especially the lower class ones, but the middle class ones as well, to some extent, they were very mixed. So so they included many different types of genres, many different kinds of performance. So it was really a kind of cabaret uh, sort of performance so that could include uh, theatre. Uh, that could include theatre. It could include some songs. Here you see Vatan Sharkasi. Uh, performed by Mademoiselle Amelia, and then some pantomime, comic opera, uh, ballet, dance pieces, chansonnette, so um, song, songs in French, presumably, and then some more substantial theatre uh, by Hilmi Effendi, based, based on the life of Napoleon. So amongst this selection of different sorts of performance you then have a musical performance and mentions a bando uh so a brass band and then some injessa uh, uh so music was only one part of a much a much uh, larger selection of entertainments <clears throat> so, so, uh, so if you could go to the next slide Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the critics, the sort of critical commentary which appeared in the press, which is always very sort of satirical and humorous and ironic. Um, this uh, sort of part part of the criticism is that what was called, say, Italian or French opera which was represented as something very civilized and very European actually 
it was a very localized uh, kind of form of performance. Uh, so usually the performers would be Christians, there would be Armenia, uh, there would be Armenians. The the instruments that that were employed in operas could could be local instruments. The kind of musical style, the whole kind of vocal delivery would have been in quite a local sort of a local kind of idiom. So so there's a gap between what is sort of considered or the the ideal of civilization and in it. Uh, European civilization, and then and then what actually happened in these uh, uh, venues. So, so this is an example of uh, the Italian ambassador was invited to Gulag Ops Theater, and then he was treated to a performance of opera, and uh, and the writer sort of says, well, how how can you invite an Italian who has grown up with the music of Verdi, Bellini, Donizetti to listen to an opera performed by Ben Liol from Haskell. Um, the performance performance included some Turkish songs as well, apparently sung, sung, by, an, sung by an Armenian singer, and the Armenians were often criticised for their pronunciation of Turkish. Uh, so apparently they had a sort of poor Turkish, and this is some, something that is frequently uh, repeated. And next slide. Yeah, so sim sim similarly, uh, similarly, you see here a comparison between the Armenian girls, the Armenian actresses and singers and the Italians. And the Armenians can't can't do opera in the same way that the Italians do. And the next slide. So, so apart from Gulagop's theatre, there were dozens and dozens of other sorts of venues which offered some some sort of Western Europe, some kind of Western European uh, form forms of entertainment. And these are described in humorous satirical terms um, so, so a couple of the key, key so a couple of the key terms here are teraki or asra teraki so so the time of progress this uh, this period in the late 19th century is the time of progress teraki and civilization and it, it, but, but what does it actually mean to be civilized so the reality of these venues that were supposed to be european they're actually quite sort of low class, low quality, the quality of the music was perceived, perceived to, to be not very good. And the musicians who worked there, so especially in the casinos, so so a lot of these musicians were female uh, and non-Muslims, and that included local non-Muslims, so Armenians, Greeks, and Jews, but also people sort of lower class, uh, people say from the Habsburg Empire, so from Central Europe, from Eastern Europe, who who refer to as Alman or Polish Lehli, uh, who who came to Istanbul for economic reasons, looking for chances to perform. They could be doing doing a tour, so visiting Istanbul, Smyrna, Alexandria, and so on. Uh, this this example refers to Jewish musicians as well. It's not clear if those are local Jewish musicians. They could also be Jews from Central Europe, from from the Habsburg Empire. That was also common to have to have uh, Jewish performers, Jewish ensembles who came from the Habsburg Empire to to Istanbul. And next slide. Yeah. So so. Part of the critique of these venues as well is that they're they're really uh, the purpose of the venue is to make a profit. So so they were profitable, and the the Beolu, uh, municipality, uh, so the Altunjadaire, they were responsible for regulating these venues in Beolu, and they're often criticised for not regulating them. Properly, I mean, they were associated with sort of uh, things that were considered very immoral, so prostitution, gambling, drinking, and so on. 
but but they were also very profitable. And this um, quote points out that uh, yeah, so Beol municipality made three hundred thousand kudos in the previous year from bulls, dances, casinos, and so on. And so these are the fruits of civilization. And the next slide is. Yeah, so so the atmosphere in these casinos and cafes was usually very noisy, very rowdy, crowded, lots of different languages, pe people of different bank, uh, people of different backgrounds, and so you see a reference here to a Greek song. So Rumja Bir Kanto uh, was performed and there was a lot of the interaction between the performers and the patrons. So it would usually be a female performer and then kind of young, a lot of young uh, men, Turkish Muslim men, who would sort of ask the, the singers to, to repeat the songs. And sometimes you see cases where a singer would refuse to do an encore and then there would be a kind of argument or a fight. Uh, would break it out, and then the authorities, the municipal authority, didn't do anything to uh, to sort of control this kinds of behaviour. Um, and the next slide. So, so another group, another another group of musicians that is mentioned in some of these contexts are Arab uh, musicians. So sometimes. Uh, referred to as Arab Chal Chalgilak or, or Egyptian musicians uh, um, uh, uh, from Masur. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so there were kind of uh, problems with translation again. The, uh, these Arab musicians who had migrated from, from Egypt or perhaps from Syria to Istanbul to make a living, so they're obviously lower class uh, musicians, they performed in Arabic. So local Turkish Turkish speaking listeners couldn't 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 necessarily understand what they were singing. And so there's some I mean, there's a joke about well, if you want to hear the translation of what the Arab musicians are singing. You should go and listen to the Turkish musicians in Cem Cember Litash. Uh, and then some also sort of derogatory uh, descriptions of the music, which sounds like Bitspazar uh, so so the noise of the flea market. So so it was criticized for, for not being very sophisticated. Um Panos, can you can you tell me how long I have left? Because because I don't have the, uh, I don't have a sense of time. Uh, I think um, we have oh, uh, yeah. some time. Yes, yes. Uh, it's uh, now we are in the coffee break, but since we were late, we can we can give you uh, more time. So uh, please go on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so the next slide. Yeah, so some, something something that comes across very strongly in these descriptions are uh, gen, gender relations. So as I said, very often the performers were female; they were non-Muslim, and the listeners were uh, the listeners were men, usually usually young men. So so certain performers, female be performers, became very well known, uh, famous, and pe people would go to the casinos, especially to listen to them and to watch them as well. And they were considered phys physically beautiful. Um, they could be associated with prostitution, or, or if they were and prostitutes, they. Uh, they were perceived to sort of seduce customers to, to get them to come into the casino and spend all of their money, get drunk and spend all of their money. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of moral anxiety about uh, young Muslim men, especially falling in love, falling in love with these singers, starting relationships with them. And in a few cases, they, uh, there were actually cases of singers 
uh, getting getting married to to Muslim men as well. And next slide, please. Uh, so so another example here of some very drunk customers who who left very large tips for for the singers hoping to get familiar with them uh but then then they were they were rejected and again i mean the performers are explicitly described as polish so lefty or jewish uh yahudi and then romanian Ula, and german um, um and uh, the next slide, please. Um, so another example here of a Jew, uh, Jewish, a Jewish musician who had come from Izmir to Istanbul, and um, so so yeah, so that's something to point out that Istanbul at this time became a sort of well, it was a. Um, uh, I mean, it was a metropolis and it was a point of attraction for, for musical performers who could come from Egypt, they could come from Izmir, uh, they could come from, from Europe to, to make a living in Istanbul. Um, yeah, so so the, Jewish, uh, the Jewish musicians, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, the Jewish com community uh, was sometimes described in quite derogatory, uh, der derogatory and offensive terms, and the pro probably the lowest social class or the most marginalised class was the gypsies, Chingene. So, so the gypsies are always described as pe people who are very talented, who have an aptitude for, for music, but who are associated with things like begging and stealing and so on. And here, here they're compared with uh, the Jewish community in quite uh, derogatory terms. Uh, but both, both of those communities, the Jews and the gypsies, are said uh, to, be, to be especially good at um, music and and the next slide. So so in conclusion, uh, I would just like to present some questions for uh, questions for reflection. So questions rather than conclusions or solution. So so something that comes across from from these materials is. A sense of ambivalence. So a lot of the discussion about the relations between different communities, different ethnic and uh, confessional communities, tends to fall into you know either the extreme of sort of peren perennial conflicts between different religious communities, or otherwise this kind of romantic ideal of cosmopolitan harmony. But actually, the relations were usually had a uh, very ambiguous or ambivalent aspect. So certain communities could, could be admired uh, for, for example, for their musical abilities, but at the same time, they were considered, uh, socially speaking, um, I've just lost the slide again. I, I need the slide to, to remember what I was going to say, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, second thing I want to highlight is the different levels of socioeconomic class. Um, so when we're thinking about relations, intercommunal relations, I mean, these are not necessarily the same at elite levels and lower levels, probably a higher degree of mixing of these in these lower class contexts. Third, third thing is the importance of migration and um, mobility. So a lot of these uh, communities, and especially musicians, they weren't. Um, they were people who were passing through Istanbul or who had recently come to Istanbul. So there's obviously an important difference between uh, relations between settled communities and then uh, relations between 
uh, between a settled community and then a, a community that has that has recently arrived. And the last thing is just to point out that most of this material is related to Galata and Bayola. There were some other districts in Istanbul that were that had similar kinds of venues and in other cities like uh, uh, like Smyrna, like Alexandria and so on. Uh, but it's important to remember that this is these are quite special situations and this is not necessarily going to be the same in central Anatolia, for example. Uh, so, so that's it. So I'll stop there and I hope we can pick, pick up some things in the discussion. Thank you.